The Teachings of Luang Po Man Po Ritato Introduction Pra Atan Man Po Ritata Maha Teira, 1870-1949, was by all accounts the most highly respected Buddhist monk in recent Thai history. He was born in 1870 in Ban Kombong, a farming village in Ubon Ratchathani Province, northeastern Thailand. Ordained in 1893, he spent the major part of his life wandering through Thailand, Burma, and Laos, dwelling for the most part in the forest, engaged in the practice of meditation. He attracted a large following of students, and, together with his teacher, Prad Zansau Gantasila Mahatera, was responsible for the establishment of the forest ascetic tradition that has now spread throughout Thailand and to several countries abroad. Much has been written about his life, but very little was recorded of his teachings during his lifetime, despite his fame as a teacher. Most of his teachings he left in the form of people, the students whose lives were profoundly shaped by the experience of living and practicing meditation under his guidance. Only one slim book of passages drawn from his sermons, Muttodaya, A Heart Released, was published during his lifetime. His students generally believed that he himself never wrote down any of his teachings, but at his death, a poem entitled Kanda Vimutti, The Ballad of Liberation from the Kantas, was found among the few papers he left behind. The Ever-Present Truth These selections are drawn from a collection of sermon fragments appended to the book Muttodaya as part of a commemorative volume distributed at Pra Jan Man's cremation in 1950. The collection was drawn from notes of Adan Mun's sermons taken by two of his students during the last two years of his life, covering a wide range of topics, including some standard accounts of the Buddha's life. The selections included here comprise all of the passages dealing directly with the practice of virtue and meditation. Some of Adan Mun's direct students have commented that the fragments would have been more subtle and insightful if the students who recorded them had been more advanced in their own meditation practice. As a result, we can only guess as to what the original sermons were like. Still, what has been recorded is worth reading and putting into practice, and so it has been translated and offered here as a gift of tamma for all who are interested. Muttodaya Muttodaya, a heart released, is a record of passages from his sermons made during the years 1944 and 45 by two monks who were staying under his guidance, and edited by a third monk an ecclesiastical official who frequently visited him for instruction in meditation. The first edition of the book was printed with his permission for free distribution to the public. The title of the book was taken from a comment made by the Venerable Chao Kuo Nupali Gunup Matarya, Jan Serechando, who, after listening to a sermon delivered by Pra Adzan Man on the root themes of meditation, praised the sermon as having been delivered with Muttodaya, a heart released, and as conveying the heart of release. The unusual style of Pra Jan Man's sermons may be explained in part by the fact that in the days before his ordination, he was skilled in a popular form of informal village entertainment called Maolam. Maolam is a contest in extemporaneous rhyming, usually reproducing the war between the sexes, in which the battle of wits can become quite fierce. Much use is made of wordplay, riddles, puns, innuendos, metaphors, and simple playing with the sounds of words. The sense of language that Ajahn Man developed in Maolam he carried over into his teachings after becoming a monk. Often he would teach his students in extemporaneous puns and rhymes. This sort of wordplay he even applied to the Pali language, and a number of instances can be cited in Muttodaya. In section 3, the pun on the word tatu, which can mean both physical element and speech element, or a phoneme. The use of the phonemes na, mo, ba, ta. The basic elements in the phrase Namo Buddhaya, homage to the Buddha, to stand for the four physical elements. The play on Namo and Mano in section 4, the use of the Bhaktana as an image for the mind in section 5, the extraction of the word Santo, peaceful, from Pave Santo in section 13 and section 16, the grammatical pun on Loke in section 14 and Santo in section 13, the threes in section 12, the eights in section 16, and so on. This sort of rhetorical style has gone out of fashion in the West, and is going out of style today even in Thailand, but in the Thailand of Ajahn Mun's time it was held in high regard as a sign of quick intelligence and a subtle mind. 
Ajahn Mun was able to use it with finesse as an effective teaching method, forcing his students to become more quick-witted and alert to implications, correspondences, multiple levels of meaning, and the elusiveness of language, to be less dogmatic in their attachments to the meanings of words, and less inclined to look for the truth in terms of language. As a John Munn once told a pair of visiting monks who were proud of their command of the medieval text, The Path of Purification, the Niddesa, the analytical expositions, on virtue, concentration, and discernment contained in that work were simply Nidana, fables or stories. If they wanted to know the truth of virtue, concentration, and discernment, they would have to bring these qualities into being in their own hearts and minds. Kanthawimutti. As Pra Zanman noted on the final page, he composed this poem during one of his brief stays in Bangkok at Wat Srapatum, Lotus Pond Monastery, probably in the early 1930s. He was apparently inspired by an anonymous poem on the theme of meditation composed and printed in Bangkok during that period, for both poems share virtually the same beginning, the 39 lines in the following translation beginning with once there was a man who loved himself. Atan Mun's poem, however, then develops in an entirely original direction and shows by far a deeper understanding of the training of the mind. Translating the poem has presented a number of difficulties, not the least of which has been getting a definitive reading of the original manuscript. Atan Mun wrote during the days before Thai spelling became standardized. Some of the passages were smudged with age, and a few seem to have been corrected by a later hand. Another difficulty has been the more general problem of finding the proper English style for translating Thai poetry, which depends heavily on rhyme, rhythm, and a stripped-down syntax, somewhat like that of telegrams and newspaper headlines. This style gives Thai poetry a lightness of style combined with a richness of meaning, but frustrates any attempt to pin down any one precise message for the sake of translation. An excellent lesson for anyone who feels that the truth is what is conveyed in words. The following translation is meant to be as literal as possible, although I have fleshed the text out when it seemed necessary to make the English intelligible. Because the original alternates between two poetic forms, glon and rai, I tried to create a similar effect in English by alternating blank verse and free verse. The result is probably too literal to be poetry, but I felt that anyone reading it would be more interested in the meaning than in verbal effects. The reader will notice that in a few places the poem seems to jump abruptly from one topic to another. In some cases these shifts were dictated by the rhyme scheme, but in others they are not really shifts at all. Keep in mind that the poem operates on several levels. In particular, two parallel themes run throughout. 1. An analysis of the external error of focusing on the faults of other people instead of one's own. And 2. A discussion of the mind's internal error of viewing and criticizing the kantas as somehow separate from its own efforts to know them. Statements made directly about one level apply indirectly to the other as well. Thus the poem covers a wider range of the practice than might appear at first glance. It's a work that rewards repeated readings. I would like to express my gratitude to Pra Zan Suatsuvato, Pra Poeti Tamma Tsariatera, for the invaluable help he gave me in untangling some of the naughtier passages in the poem. Any mistakes that may remain, of course, are mine. The Venerable Ka Nisaro Beku, Metaphorist Monastery. <laughs>